Look, could someone point to the fact that it's not even February yet and we've already had our capital overrun by insurrectionists and Donald Trump got impeached and Reddit almost took down an entire hedge fund with GameStop stock and ask, what the hell is the point in making predictions about this year? Would they have a good point? Yeah, yeah, shit, they would. Well, I already told TikTok I was gonna do it, so screw it. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. If this is your first time here, my name is Gerard LeConte, and I'm here every Sunday morning to dive deep into something that has caught my attention, usually something to do with American politics or government. And I'm really glad that you've joined me today because we're delving into a topic that never fails to fascinate, the future. One quick caveat, none of these predictions should be interpreted as endorsements, they're simply observations. The first space that I'm watching is cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Obviously, 2020 was already a pretty big year for cryptocurrency, especially as a means of storing value. As the Fed injected trillions of dollars into the economy, investors were looking for a relatively safe place to store their cash that might not be as subject to inflation as traditional investments, and a lot of them found Bitcoin. It wasn't only individual investors, but also institutional investors that got in on the fund. MicroStrategies converted all of their cash to Bitcoin, and massive multinational investment corporations like Grayscale and BlackRock put significant portions on Bitcoin, which has given crypto a big bump in credibility. While I think the value of crypto is primed to grow even more in 2021 than it did in 2020, that's not really what I'm keeping my eye on. I'm more interested in its, and specifically Ethereum's, ability to disrupt markets. Take a look at what happened with GameStop this week. Independent retail investors banded together on the subreddit Wall Street Bets to pull off the first crowdsourced short squeeze in history, and they almost took down a hedge fund in the process. The hedge fund gambled on the demise of GameStop, and these investors called their bluff. It was a massive win for individuals who increasingly believe that markets and the people who claim to be experts in those markets are taking advantage of them. It was a big statement that the monopoly on advantaged information that so many people like those who run these hedge funds have profited on for so long is under siege. Unfortunately, the folks who pulled this off had one big blind spot. They used a centralized platform, Robinhood, to do it. And since Robinhood is a centralized organization, those in leadership can be leaned on and pressured. There's one neck to choke, and it quickly got choked until Robinhood shut the party down. That would be impossible to do on a decentralized version of Robinhood built on a blockchain network like Ethereum, where there would be no proverbial neck to choke. Attempts at building decentralized financial tools are well underway. There's a whole movement behind it, in fact. It's called DeFi, and it's only a matter of time before entrepreneurs meet this consumer demand for decentralized services in finance and other markets across the economy. There are awesome projects being built in lending, travel, payments, and so much more that can fundamentally disrupt what we accept except as normal in those verticals, not to mention all the use cases that haven't even been thought of yet. I'm extremely excited about this space. The next space I'm watching is Congress. Granted, I'm always watching Congress, but the fact is that a Congress like this doesn't come around very often, and it's worth paying close attention to. An incumbent hasn't lost the White House in almost 30 years. The Senate hasn't had a 50-50 split in almost 20 years. Democrats haven't had full control of the executive and legislative branches at the same time in 11 years, and the 117th Congress will be the most diverse ever. It's a stage set for a Congress that behaves in unexpected ways. It's clear that the president has every intention of being highly productive, having signed more executive orders in his first week than any president in history, but he'll need a similarly productive Congress if he wants the impact of his time in office to last, and that comes down to consensus building and good old vote whipping. In the House, Democrats can lose five votes and still pass bills, but in the Senate, Democrats need to win the votes of at least 10 Republicans to pass anything outside of reconciliation, assuming that the filibuster doesn't go anywhere. So are there any coalitions available to bring these votes together? There's actually a fair amount of ideological diversity on the Democratic side of things. You have the centrist Democrats like Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth out of Illinois who are very closely aligned with Biden's politics. This probably accounts for about 30 Democratic senators. It's hard to imagine him proposing many things that they would object to. Then you have the conservative Democrats, the Joe Manchins and Kirsten Sinemas of the world who frankly are too afraid to lose their seats to do the right thing and nuke the filibuster. Anyway, those are the first votes you're going to lose if anything's perceived to be too liberal. There's only like three of them, but three is still a big number with margins this thin. Then there are the liberal Democrats, your Bernie Sanders, your Elizabeth Warren, your Ed Markey's. This accounts for close to 10 Democrats, and they don't take kindly to their votes being taken for granted. Finally, there are centrist Republicans and possible swing Republicans. It's important to note that there are no liberal Republicans, which makes the party distinct from their counterparts. However, there are the likes of Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski who could have 
potential legitimate electoral liabilities if they're perceived as being too ideological. This is like maybe three votes. Then there are the votes who might be able to be swung if the pie is sweet enough. Your Ben Sasses or your Richard Burrs, for example. But that's a big maybe. In general, finding 10 Republican votes for anything will be hard. But it's also hard to know who would be hurt more if Republicans act as obstructionists. Keep an eye on it. Last is climate. And it's true that it seems like every year is supposedly the year that climate policy comes to the forefront, but what's life without tradition? In 2021, America has a president in Joe Biden that accepts the science behind climate change and takes it to be his responsibility to not only reverse the damage done by a science denying predecessor, but also make the country a global leader in addressing the climate crisis. Additionally, 2021 is the first milestone for the Paris Climate Accord. All of the countries in the accord will meet in Glasnow in November for COP26 and revisit the expectations for emission reduction, which ratchet up this year. It shouldn't be taken for granted the importance of America being an international partner in climate efforts. We're still the world's second largest emitter, so our collaboration with the efforts of other countries grants those efforts much needed credibility and impact. Biden has also chosen in Janet Yellen, his Treasury Secretary, and Brian Deese, his head of the National National Economic Council to two people who have a very climate-centric approach to labor and the economy. But it's not just the government. 2021 offers the opportunity for the private sector to get in on the goods in ways that we haven't seen before. Electric vehicles, for example, have more momentum than ever before. GMC is producing an electric Hummer. Tesla is releasing the new Model S that goes zero to 60 in less than two seconds and their truck, which is the biggest market in America. Most major car brands have multiple electric cars on the map. And if charging networks and range see advancements this year, gas guzzlers will be a thing of the past soon. Finally, climate is ready to put its stamp on finance. 2020 saw ESG, or Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance, reach the mainstream, and 2021 could be the year that it becomes a default expectation, which is to say that the environmental and social externalities of a corporation will become a fundamental aspect of the valuation of that corporation. We're going to start to see ESG and climate-centric funds outperform their traditional counterparts, and going green will be a requirement in obtaining investment. And those are the spaces that I'm watching in 2021. Cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, the 117th Congress and government and private sector responses to climate change. What do you think? What did I miss? Will none of this matter because 2021 will actually turn out to be dogier? <laughs> Let me know in the comments and better yet, hit subscribe, crush the like button, share the video, and let's take this channel to the moon. Also check me out on TikTok. We're having a hell of a time over there. Have the best week that you can and I'll see you next Sunday.